प्रचुर भारी है Hello everyone, uh, whoever is watching my presentation today uh, online right now. Let me briefly uh, introduce myself. Um, I am one of the five directors at GAO, Global Academy of Ocean Integration. I am a, I am a uh, prosthodontist. So I'll be mostly talking to you about uh, implant prosthetics. Uh, our group, uh, GAO, has been focusing on, one, uh, educating new dentists fresh out of school uh, so that they can learn what implant is and how to place implants and how to do uh, prosthetic uh, restoration and maintenance, and two, sharing our unique concepts and techniques uh, in implant dentistry with the rest of the world. For more than 10 years, actually, we started uh, 2008 or 2009, and uh, we've been doing this for more than 10 years. The topic of my presentation today is a rationale for implant therapy uh, rationale to be uh, exact. I'm sure um, every one of you is pretty familiar with this graph that's showing on the slide. You know, this is about the uh, the stability change over time uh, with implant. Uh, this graph basically shows you uh, the change of implant stability over time from placement up from the placement uh, until the completion uh, of bone remodeling around the implant. I will get back to you on this a little bit later again. I found this interesting picture on, on the internet. Uh, I named it, you know, sharing the same moment. I've heard people saying, life is all about timing. You know, the time you meet new people and you get to work with them and you uh, start uh, making things and being successful and all, you know, it's all, all about timing. Uh, for example, in this picture, to the bird, it's probably a moment of joy. He, uh, he or she found the trick, you know, prey. But to the fish, it's going to be a moment of death, you know. It's, uh, excuse me for uh, for my language there, but um, timing really matters. That's what I wanted to say to all of you. And if you do not know when a disaster can ha happen, um, there were times when all we all believed after placing an implant, you know, we should wait for at least three to four months, at least, before we start loading. But after, after getting a reasonable success, people start thinking uh, of ways to reduce waiting period, and they started to load faster and faster. And nowadays, you know, uh, some clinics or some dentists make teeth even on the same day or even in an hour. But why do you really want to expedite the whole process of implants? The, ans the answer is simple, I believe. 
Why do you want to take airplane instead of train to get, you know, to somewhere? It's obvious, isn't it? What's wrong with being uh, faster? What's wrong with getting work done faster? Among these many different loading protocols, let me ask you, what is yours? What is your loading protocol? And my presentation today is about this loading protocol. As long as you have your reasoning, reasons to believe something, you know, you should be okay. Back in 80s and even up to late 90s, most of the dentists waited three to six months before loading. People believe that three to six months is like a must. You should wait before loading unless, I mean, if, if you don't, you, you're doomed to get a failure. This was somewhat empirical though. Uh, it did not really have too much scientific background for, you know, for waiting that long. There have been changes in the consensus of different loading protocols, immediate, early, conventional, or even delayed. For immediate loading, it was within the same day in 2002, and then became 48 hours, two days, next year at the third ITI consensus, and it became three days, and conventional loading was three months until that point. But recently, actually 2013, the fifth ITI consensus, the conventional loading was changed, changed to uh, two months from three months. So that means Unless you have really uh, poor bone density or not enough bone volume at all, uh, you should be okay to load, go ahead and load your implants after two, two months uh, from the placement. This is world average. But whatever loading protocol you have, are we sure it's the right time for loading? Maybe not. Maybe so. I ask people around me when they load their implants. Here are the answers I've got from them. Well, first one was uh, they wanted to hear clear ringing sound when they tap the freshly placed implant with, with something like a mirror handle, you know, metal rod. You should be hearing a very clear sound. That means, like, like this, if you tap it after, place, after you place your implants, there is going to be a sound. It should be really crispy and uh, uh, ringing sound. But if you don't, if you hear a very dull sound, that means the fixation of the implant uh, or the stability is not good, uh, maybe not good enough for loading. But some people use insertion torque instead. You know, I know many people use somewhere between 30 to 50 or even up to 60. Uh, uh, to think that, you know, the fixation is good enough. I don't know if it's uh, good enough for loading, but, you know, they want to have high insertion torque uh, when they place their implants. Like this. And a lot of people also use something called RFA, 
uh, ISQ, the, the Austell ISQ uh, instrument is probably the one most famous RFA uh, instrument. Um, they, they think that the uh, 70 ISQ value uh, or above should be enough for loading. But why 70 though? Can it really be a guideline for loading the uh, ISQ value of 70? Uh, the, the, the number 70 probably came from this uh, website, you know, the OSTO. This is the web page of the, the, uh, the RFA instrument company. And uh, what, uh, one of the information you can find on the website is this diagram. In this diagram, it clearly says the immediate loading can be done for a single missing area if you have above 70. Let me get back to you on this uh, next time when we talk about the methods of objective methods to evaluate implant stability probably about three weeks from now or four weeks. Next one, next answer that I get from people is that uh, we need LC integration before loading. You know, so they want to wait if they have LC integration. But how do we know if we have LC integration? You know, just waiting for long enough, would that guarantee if we have uh, oscillation or not? Uh, maybe not. I'll, I'll get back to you on this again uh, in, in a minute. Next group, you know, there's a huge competition, especially in Korea these days, you know, between ten, dental practices. Uh, if you're a patient, where would you go? You know, the practice A uh, saves you time. You know, they, they say they can do this in, in less than a month. Or, you know, practice B says, you know, it takes two months. Where would you go? It's obvious, isn't it? The next one, this is a joke, but um, based on the month prediction, uh, you might want to finish the treatment, you know, and have the patient pay the bill uh, uh, earlier than you used to. But, uh, you know, again, you know, this is a joke. Last one would be, you know, patients' demand. You know, you know, these days, patients can't wait long. You know, they don't want to wait too long. They want their work done faster. So. Um, this can be one of the reasons that you want to get uh, your implant done faster. Uh, among these seven answers, which one do you think is the, the correct answer? I, I, I think all of these can be right. All of these are right, depending on the situation, depending on what you believe. But I'm sure no one would argue with number four. You know, you should have OS integration because this is what we've been taught over the years in, in dental school and also after you graduate from your you know, dental school. This is what we've been taught. You must have OS integration. And this will be. Uh, called conventional loading. Two month of waiting period. But what really is OSI integration though? That's the question. Do we know what OSI integration is? We think we do, but we, we might not. What do clinicians 
or researchers say about Austrian integration. But here's an example. What Academy of Austrian integration says about Austrian integration? This is what they say. Austrian integration is when the bone cells attach themselves directly to the titanium surface of the implants. This is called Austrian integration. Or, you know, what do other people say? You know, like Brenner, Dr. Brenner Mark, Dr. Uh, Albrechtson, Dr. Schroeder, they all think Austrian integration can be defined as a direct uh, connection between the bone cell and titanium surface. Dr. Schroeder even called it uh, ankylosis between the implant and the bone surface. Well, this is nice, but here comes another question. Um, aren't, aren't we forgetting something else? That's my question. I think we're forgetting this, BIC ratio, bone implant contact ratio. When we say Aussie integration, we're talking about a phenomenon at a uh, microscopic level. But for, for implants to be loaded, there's much more important thing uh, we need to consider. And this is it, bone implant contact ratio. Uh, I just found out a, uh, found a uh, very meaningful review, review article just out in, uh, 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 in March. And uh, in, in that article, I noticed that it says, in all well-integrated retrieved implants, the bone implant contact varied from about 30% to 95%. Well, this is a huge interval. You know, 30% and 95%, there's a huge difference. Do you really believe we can load an implant with the BIC contact of only 30%? It's hard to believe, isn't it? Another study by Dr. Uh, Coelho, he mentions uh, something very close to this. Uh, what he observed was, the, was that uh, the BIC ratio varied from even 20% to 95%. We're talking about successful implants, which has been functioning over the years. They just happen to be retrieved. So this basically means, you know, we believe we need Aussie integration, but those successful implants, which can be loaded, only needs maybe 30% of bone implant contact, or sometimes 60%, or even 95%. There is a too much variation in terms of bone Im implant contact ratio. I think this is very important. Let me show you a, a clinical example. Uh, the patient's uh, upper right and uh, right central and lateral incisors were fractured. So uh, we decided to place an implant immediately after extraction. So I try to extract the teeth as uh, atraumatic as possible, especially to preserve the, the buccal plate of bone. And this shows you placing two implants slightly palatally, which you, you can't really see from this view. 
And instead of taking rubber impression after surgery, I used one of the surgical indexing to make temp, uh, provisional restoration. I'll skip uh, most of these uh, prosthetic process. Uh, this just try, uh, I just wanted to show you uh, what I did. I changed the diagnostic uh, model to uh, the working cast using the surgical indexing technique. So this is what I got on the day of extraction and also the day of placement, implant placement using one of the uh, prefabricated abutments. I just trimmed it a little and then uh, fabricated a provisional restoration on the same day. This is about three to four days after the placement. You can see the soft tissue is healing. Uh, about a week after and this is pretty, pretty much when I took another impression to make final prosthesis because the patient had to leave out of country uh, uh, in, in a week at that point. So I, I had to go ahead and make the final prosthesis. Again, I used the same method, the surgical indexing, this time with rubber impression material a, a little bit because I had to impress the soft tissue morphology around the implants. Although the soft tissue healing was not really completed at that time. Again, the prosthetic uh, process, I changed the diagnostic model again, this time with uh, the uh, something like uh, the peri-implant gingiva material. So this is the final working cast on which I made uh, final processes on. And this is less than two weeks from the placement, the extraction and placement of the implant. And this is what it looks like from um, front. And this is eight years follow up last year. This, I took this picture last year. And the x-ray shows you uh, the great preservation of the interdental bone. And the, bone, the whole bone level is pretty good after about nine years. So, did I have osseointegration integration for in this particular case before loading? Probably not. And there's another case, molar case. Number 46, patient's right uh, mandibular, right first molar was fractured and I extracted again as atraumatic as possible and try to do osteotomy through septum and the implant was placed with pretty good uh, insertion torque and also the RFA value and this is this radiograph was taken right after the surgery and I love to use one of these wide healing abutments uh, so that we can have probably not 100% uh, sealing, but uh, good enough sealing to induce uh, proper healing uh, of the soft tissue and also the bony tissue. Four days post-op, and four weeks, all the soft tissues are pretty much healed nicely, but not for the bone. Looking at this radiograph, uh, even after four weeks, you, we still have uh, not enough bone healing. Uh, 
those extraction sockets were not really uh, filled with new bone formation. So we still have uh, 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 more to go in terms of healing. And this has been uh, eight weeks. And still the bone healing is not completed. And this is what uh, I went ahead and made final prosthesis for this particular patient. Again, uh, I had some time uh, limitation. The patient had to leave, so I had to finish this a little earlier than wh what I used to. Four week, uh, eight weeks post-op, and uh, I don't really have the uh, follow-up radiograph that I took from last year, but uh, patients have been functioning with no problem. The bone level is great, and uh, it's been more than six years. Again, uh, did I have osteointegration for this particular patient? Probably not again. So what's the key for loading then? This is what, uh, uh, this is what I want to ask all of you. What's the key for loading if it's not osteointegration? Have you ever seen one of these TV commercials? This is, this is from one of the uh, bedding company, you know, famous for uh, mattresses and uh, bed frameworks. And I, I've seen this promoting video clip from the camp company. And during this, the video clip, uh, it repeatedly saying in Korean, comfort with no wobble. I, I think it's, I think it perf perfectly explains how loading works. No wobble, which means no mobility during function. And I think that's the key for loading not osseointegration itself. So we all know what micromotion of implant can do to the implants itself. Micromotion simply ruin uh, dental implants by disturbing osseos, um, osteogenesis. They sometimes let the fibrous tissue grow between uh, the implant and the bone surface, which eventually makes the implant fail. So this is why we're interested in stability of implants. We want to know if our implants are stable enough to be loaded. There are two kinds of stabilities, primary and secondary stability. And primary stability is the one we get right after placing implants. So this is pretty much mechanical interlocking between the fixture and the bone. So this is more of a uh, macrostructure uh, stability. And secondary stability is uh, what we get over time after placing implants. So this is more of a, a biological uh, stability. From the, something we get from new bone formation, bone remodeling process. When we monitor the implant stability over time, after implant placement, this is what we find. The primary stability uh, decreases as the secondary stability increases uh, from the placement of the implant. So the overall stability, the total stability, has a little dip uh, 
during this healing period, which we call a dip or some people call it drop, the stability drop. This, this phenomenon has been uh, termed a dip or drop of impl uh, implant stability. Uh, although there is a lack of agreement, this no loading period will exist. Some people say this is somewhere between a month to two months, and some people say that's a little shorter, shorter than that. And I, I believe this highly related to the consensus of loading protocols that we just we've just talked about. And I, I believe this is one of the reasons why we, uh, we believe the consensus of uh, conventional loading is eight weeks, two months. Do we have scientific backup for this? Eight weeks? Yes, we have plenty out there. We can, we can easily find uh, numerous studies saying in less than eight weeks, the implant st stability is recovered to, to where it first started. After uh, going through a little dip, so the stability goes back to uh, the first stability that the implant had at the time of placement. Another study pretty much just said the same thing. Another study by Dr. Glauser. They all say within eight weeks, the stability recovers. One more study by Dr. Balshi. Unfortunately, I personally believe, unfortunately, uh, all these studies use RFA to assess assess implant stability, which I believe uh, quite not objective or even scientific. I personally believe the consensus about these protocol needs to be changed now, especially the conventional uh, loading needs to be changed from eight weeks to four weeks. This is my personal belief. But I have reasons to believe that way. Four weeks is what Strauman implant has been insisting uh, is needed before loading. In year 2005, they launched this new implant which, with new surface, which, is, which was called SLA active, SL active. What they claimed was that uh, by improving the implant surface, they can induce much faster newborn formation, which in turn uh, make the whole uh, healing process faster so that they can load faster. Accelerated formation of new bone contributes to a faster uh, secondary stability increase. And this will reduce the amount of the total stability dip as you can see uh, right there. So the total stability of conventional implants goes down this much, but with improved surface, you can get, since you can get a faster secondary stability increase, so the total stability goes a little less. 
So this is what they been uh, what they claimed. Well, I can I found another study which backs up you know this four week consensus thing that by Dr. Simunek. He uh, based on his study, the time needed the implant stability uh, to recover can be reduced to four weeks, not eight weeks. I think this is possible because we now have you know, better implants, better implant designs, better technique, and you know, improved surface and everything. So I think that's very feasible. But in addition to accelerating newborn formation, I mean uh, increasing second, uh, stabi secondary stability faster, if we could delay uh, the loss of primary stability somehow, the total stability dip will be even smaller, like this. Or we don't even have any stability dip. The st stability might remain the same from the start to the end. We're not going to have any uh, stability drop or dip as long as we can increase, I mean, delay the loss of primary stability, we can have this. And this will make early or even immediate loading possible. Let's think what, what can increase the primary stability now, there are two things we want to talk about. First one would be implant design. For implants to be engaged into, into bone strongly, we need certain design. You know, tapered apex or strong thread design probably can maximize the self-tapping capability of implants compared to conventional design, which, which is shown on the left. Uh, it can give you much stronger uh, fixation, which means primary, primary stability. We used to have parallel bodies a long time ago. We still have these days, but probably not, uh, not that many. And the body shape, uh, uh, become more and more tapered over time. To obtain strong self-tapping, this is replaced in 2005. And NeoBiotech came up with tapered body in 2006 and also in 2008. The threat design also became quite aggressive at that time to increase or to maximize the self-tapping capability. In 2010, uh, also Nobel Active came with uh, the tapered body and strong thread design. And in 2019, even Strawman Company gave up on the old conventional design and came up with this new uh, aggressive thread design. I think this, is, this means uh, a lot. You know, the Strauman Implant Company changed their, uh, the way they, uh, uh, they've been maintaining for last more than 10 years at least, but they, they changed to get adapted to uh, the new, the new environment in implant dentistry.
compared to conventional thread design, which is shown on the left, uh, this cannot resist the lateral forces effectively enough, as you can see in this uh, slide. But on the right, with this new thread design, in this particular case, it's called lower half triangle uh, threads. This reaches to lateral forces much better because uh, uh, which we need for faster loading. So again, this is to increase or to maximize the self-tapping and primary stability of implants when we place them. Primary stability obviously can be influenced uh, by implant diameter and the length, but some studies, these studies show that uh, the primary, st primary stability is mainly affected by the diameter, not the length, which I agree. Second thing we want to think about is the, the implant placement protocol. Uh, how we actually place our implants. The surgical technique, I would say. You can usually get uh, two different fixations when placing implant. One from crestal cortical bone, uh, the other from the cancellous bone area. From research, such as uh, the finite element analysis or uh, photoelastic study, we know that most of the, the uh, occlusal stress can get uh, concentrated on the crustal area, the cortical bone, like this. And that's why the thickness of the cortical bone is important uh, uh, in terms of getting good stability. But these studies say you know, there's a positive correlation between the cortical bone thickness and initial stability or the primary stability. But what if we have a really strong cortical bone. And uh, you know, I'm sure every one of us have, uh, have a case like this. You know, the last millimeter or two of the implant, implants you're placing wouldn't, would not go in, you know, all the way down. So what we, what you, have to do is, you know, take the implant out and drill a little deeper or wider and then try to seat the implant again so that we can seat the implant all the way down and, and level up with the crystal cortical bone level. Uh, some people are usually, probably usually uh, beginners and, and tend to uh, drill deeper or wider so that they, don't, they can avoid these problems. Uh, so if the insertion torque exceeds our physiologic threshold, that can be a problem sometimes. Like in this case report by Dr. Homley Wang, he presented a case about 10 years ago, and it was about compression necrosis. In this report, following the surgery, there was a progressive bone loss around the implant, starting from the crystal area and down to the apex of the implant. And finally, the implant failed. And, and I'm sure many of us uh, have experienced something like this. 
maybe many times. So this is a dilemma we have. You want to have a good crystal cortical fixation, but, but then you don't want to compress the bone too much because it might kill the bone. What Dr. Homley Wang suggested from this study, case report, was that uh, two things. Either you relieve the pressure by untorquing, unscrewing the implant slightly after you place the implant, or simply use something like uh, tap. This particular burr is called a countersink burr. We used to use this a lot. And some imp imp uh, implant systems still use this. This is to relieve the pressure uh, on the crestal bone when we place implants. As you can see, these gaps between the cortical bone and and the coronal part of the implant, there's a gap because you just relieve the bone to avoid the excessive pressure. We also used something called pre-tap, which is shown on the right. Uh, not many implant manufacturers still have this though. It may be an old concept, but I, I really believe it's a brilliant um, idea to get really good primary stability. Uh, I don't really understand why many implant companies gave up, gave up on this. Although this is a uh, Finite, finite element analysis, a distract, destructive stress uh, can get concentrated on the thread peaks in crystal cortical bone, like this, which is shown in red. This is a too much stress on the crystal bone. Whereas the occlusal stresses are uniformly distributed in the crystal cortical bone when we use pre-tap. You don't really see the excessive stress on the critical uh, crystal bone area. More desirable uh, stress distribution can be achieved with pre-tap. We performed a uh, animal study with, with these two different burrs, countersink and pre-tap. How these two burrs behaved differently or uh, gave different results is shown in this uh, histological sections. This is two weeks after surgery. You can see with countersink burr, you can see there's a huge gap between the fixture and the bone, the cortical bone. And after four weeks, the, those gaps are still not completely filled uh, after four weeks. So there's a huge gap to start with, and those gaps are not completely filled even uh, after a certain amount of time. But with pre-tap, pre though, there's much less gap to begin with, but uh, two weeks after the surgery. And after four weeks, those gaps are uh, almost completely filled with new bone. I think this means 
a lot because we were just talking about BIC ratio, you know. Although we, we don't really know what BIC ratio is uh, high enough so that we can start loading, but the higher the better probably. 90% uh, would be better than 60%. No one would argue that. But some might say, you know, like in these articles, overcompression may not necessarily cause bone necrosis. I agree. There are many articles saying, you know, extremely high insertion torque did not cause implant failure. But there's another reason why we still want to avoid overcompression. They might not kill the implant or uh, induce implant failures, but uh, there's, some, there's another reason we want to avoid uh, overcompression. As I just mentioned uh, uh, about a minute ago, if if only we can maintain the primary stability after surgery, this is how the total stability would behave. Uh, it might not have any stability dip or it might even go up over time, which means you can load any time during the course of healing because you're not going to have any stability dip or drop. Again, why primary stability decrease? It's because the bone gets traumatized during surgery. We know when bone gets traumatized, uh, it usually goes through bone healing around the implant. Uh, first, we start with uh, bone resorption and then uh, the bone remodeling uh, process follows. However, when the trauma to the bone is minimal, like a uh, green stick fracture, the healing process can be does not really necessarily cause uh, bone resorption. So you're, you're, you're going to have only the bone formation process without any bone resorption. And this is what we want during, during implant surgery. We want the minimal trauma to the bone so that the bone can heal much faster without bone resorption process necessarily. But how can we minimize the bone resorption? I want to point out two things. Uh, one is to avoid any overheating during osteotomy, obviously. That's something we have to avoid um, as much as we can. And the second one would be we also need to avoid too much pressure when we place implants. Uh, over compression, I would say. As long as we can avoid those two, we're going to have very minimized uh, uh, surgical trauma to the bone. This first one is an old concept for delayed loading. We have full drilling and the implant fixture is uh, placed with self-tapping capability only. But in the middle, although it's still for delayed loading, we want, it, we want to avoid any overstress on the cortical bone area, so we use countersink, 
and self-compaction in cancellous bone area. So again, you can see these gaps. So th this is not quite for uh, accelerated loading protocol. But the last one, the self-compaction in cancellous bone area is the same. But the way we treat cortical bone is slightly different from the countersink. We use pre-tap instead so that we can have much closer adaptation of the fixture to the bone throughout the bone, you know, in the cortical bone and also in the cancellous bone area. And I believe this is what we should aim at when we are talking about accelerated loading, early or immediate loading. Well, this is pretty much what I prepared for the first part today. And next part or the next presentation, which will be about three to four weeks from now, will be about the objective methods of uh, to evaluate implant stability, including RFA, perio test, and everything. Especially, I want to point out the myth about RFA and see what works and what does not, and why, and etc. Et I really hope everyone can join me again next time. And actually, the next week will be doc by Dr. Chung Yup Kim, who is a good friend of mine. I hope you enjoy his lecture, and I'm sure he, you will. And again, thanks for uh, watching my presentation today, and uh, hope to see you again next time.